Just in case you were thinking that a forensic psychiatrist is a psychiatrist that does psychotherapy on dead people, that's not correct, okay? Because I often get that, oh, you, you provide therapy on dead people? No. Uh, basically what we are is we're the interface between psychiatry and the law, okay? So in the Army, we do court martials, we do expert witness testimony, uh, we consult on cases, um, we do insanity defense evaluations, things like that. Okay, and so with that, I'll go ahead and I'll move forward. Here's our agenda. You can use this agenda as a safety brief if you want to, really. If you look at the topics on here, these are things that you can talk to your service members about. Okay, and we're going to kind of go through these. And, and really what I want to do is I really want to share with you the feedback that I have gotten from my patients, the feedback that I have gotten from clients, um, the feedback that I've gotten from people that have been accused of crimes, the feedback that I've gotten from victims, um, feedback I've gotten from attorneys, uh, judges, okay? It's a lot of feedback that I get after each case. And I've kind of compiled that feedback, and it's mainly things that people said that they didn't know, or they wish they would have known, okay? And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk to you about today is basically what my clients have told me. And I want to share that with you because I think that we've done a good job with doing the education and uh, with all the, um, the sharp training that we got to do. And, and we're actually um, making a difference because the numbers, although still very high, they're actually better than they were a few years ago as far as the number of assaults. We're making progress, but we have a long way to go. And I think that a lot of times with the clients that I've spoken to, if they, they say that if they would have known what the consequence, consequences were, that they maybe would have changed their behavior and not gotten themselves into the situation that they found themselves in. And so that's really what I want to share with you and, and go over today. So focusing more on the consequences. Now, the other thing that I'll say up front is this talk is not really geared towards people who are predators and people who are out there taking advantage of people because I think that those folks need to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. They need to be convicted. They need to go to prison. Okay? That's the bottom line on that. But there's a lot of well-intended people who might go out to a party or situation and find themselves intoxicated to the point where they can't defend themselves. They didn't mean to get that way when they left their house. They didn't say, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to go out tonight and get myself so drunk that I get assaulted. But we have a lot of people that that happens to. Let's talk about underage drinking. Because a majority of the cases that I get involved in, both the victim and the accused are not 21. But both of them were intoxicated. So how do we get after this underage drinking? Can we? I don't know. I think we can if we utilize it and we make an example of it and we talk about it with our, with our, um, with our soldiers or our service members. You know, you can say, hey, you know what, don't have sex until you're married, you know, don't do this, don't do that, abstinence. Can you make a difference? I don't know. Depending on who you are, you might, you might not. A lot of my clients, patients, thank you, they don't know what binge drinking is. They don't know what the definition of binge drinking is. Well, there actually is a definition of binge drinking. And that is something that I think that when you're doing your safety briefings, your talks, let them know that there is something that does exist and it is called binge drinking and there's a definition of it so that they understand what that means. So bottom line here, in a two hour period, if you are female and you have four drinks, you are binge drinking. If you're a male and you have five drinks in that same two hour period, it's called binge drinking. Bad things happen to people when they binge drink. And that's what soldiers need to know. If you go and you drink five, for a man, if you drink five or more drinks in a two hour period, you are binge drinking by definition and you're putting yourself at risk for bad things to happen to you. Okay? Because a lot of people just don't know that. The other thing that I see in a lot of my cases, you see those red cups right there? Those are bad. They show up in just about every court martial. Those red cups, and you know what else shows up along with those red cups? A little white ball. And soldiers like to take that little white ball 
And they like to throw it in that little red cup. And they like to drink. Okay? And it's called beer pump, right? I'm sure you guys have heard of it, but it's very popular. And a lot of our uh, service members are playing it. And just about every court martial that I go to, these red cups always show up with the white ball. Okay? So I, I point that out to people. And they laugh about it, but then they come back and they tell me, you know what, I went to a party and I thought about what you said and they had these red cups and that white ball and I just left. Because I remember what you said, okay? So talking to your soldiers about playing beer pong and what happens when people do that because they binge drink and they get intoxicated very quickly when they binge drink. So how does alcohol affect the body? It can affect the whole body, okay? But let's just talk about the brain. We'll focus on the brain. Because the front part of the brain, that's where they lose judgment. Inside of the brain, more in the middle part, we're talking about memory. And we'll talk about that in a second. But the bottom line is, people want to go out. They want to have a good time. So they go to a bar. They have a drink. They might start dancing. That leads, one thing leads to the next. They see somebody they like. Hey, can I buy you a drink? Oh, yeah, sure. So they buy the drink. Now they're dancing, they've had the second drink, and kind of the story goes on and on and on. They can become intoxicated. They can actually become so intoxicated that they can die from it or get in coma, okay? But what about the middle range? That's what we're talking about. That middle range and when did they lose the ability to consent? That's the issue that we have to talk about. Some people don't know that alcohol poisoning exists. So you want to talk to your service members and let them know that there is such a thing called alcohol poisoning because they just don't know. I recently came back from Honduras where I was assigned for a year and I had a young patient who was a Marine. Now, I was a hospital corpsman when I first joined the military with the Fleet Marine Force. So I, I, Marines are really near and dear to my heart. And this young Marine had just turned 21 and he went out and he got alcohol poisoning. And he showed up in our emergency room. And when I was talking to him, he was so remorseful. He was, he just, he was bawling because he had no idea that there was anything called alcohol poisoning. And he almost lost his life. And he said, what would I have done to my mother if I would have died? And he just broke down crying. Because he had no idea that there was anything that existed called alcohol poisoning. So letting them know that this exists and what it is. The key thing here, these are some of the signs, but the bottom line is they basically stop breathing and they die. Okay? And it requires treatment. You can see there, over 50,000 cases a year of alcohol poisoning. And people end up in the ICU. So you want to make sure that, again, that your service members know what a blackout is. I've had patients that have come to me as a psychiatrist that said, I just needed to come talk to a psychiatrist because of what happened to me this past weekend. And I say, well, what happened? And they'll say, well, I was drinking, and the next thing I remember was I woke up in a strange place, totally naked, had no idea where I was or how I got there, and it freaked me out. And then I tell them about blackouts, and they say I had no idea that anything like that could happen. I'd never heard of a blackout before in my life. But it scared them enough that they came in to find out what was going on. So make sure, if you're a leader, make sure your subordinates know that a blackout is something that is real. And what it is, I'm going to tell you what it is. There's two types. There's fragmentary and in block. The fragmentary is where a person can remember bits and pieces of what happened throughout the night. In block is where they have no memory whatsoever. They remember going to a bar. They remember having a couple of drinks, and that's it. They don't remember anything else, how they got home or anything. That's the end block. Fragmentary is more common, and it happens pretty frequently. You just lose bits and pieces of what happened. The memory never got encoded, so you can't retrieve it. It was never encoded into your long-term memory. So it doesn't exist. And this is what happens when pe some people, to some people when they drink, especially when they binge drink. And the research gives you different ranges of blood alcohol concentration. But the bottom line is, the faster you drink, you're more likely, if you're susceptible to getting a blackout, to having a blackout. 
Okay? The other thing, I put this slide here because you can see the total number, the dollar figure there in the middle of this slide. If somebody drinks and they get a DUI, it's probably going to cost them around fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars. Okay? A lot of people don't know that. They just think, well, if I get pulled over and I'm drinking, I'll get pulled over. Yeah, I may lose my license. Blah blah blah. No, it's going to cost you about sixteen grand. You, you may spend the night or a couple nights in jail. There's other things that are going to happen, but I think the dollar figure is what kind of stands out. So make sure your subordinates know the cost or the consequence of drinking and driving. These two people right here. Well, let's just say that the female went to the party. She had no intention on getting assaulted that night. Okay? But she went. The male went to the party, had no intention on assaulting anybody. They were both drinking. They both got intoxicated. They went back to the apartment or wherever they went. They did whatever they did, and now they wake up the next morning, and now what is she saying? What is, what is that picture telling you? What is she asking herself? Okay? And what is he thinking? Okay? We're here. How did we get here? What happened? Okay? This, this happens a lot, and there's a lot of cases that are going to court martial that have this scenario right here. Okay? A lot of times we try to talk about fault and whose fault it was, and it wasn't your fault that you were dressed this way, or it wasn't your fault that you said this, or it wasn't your fault that you went here. But what my advice is, really, it doesn't matter whose fault it is, because now you're sitting in my clinic and your quality of life is down. Okay? Yes, it wasn't your fault. But guess what? You're here in my clinic now. It's kind of like if you're a pedestrian and you are in a crosswalk and you have the right of way, right? The pedestrian has the right of way. So you say, well, you know what? I'm a pedestrian. I'm going to walk through this crosswalk. You see a vehicle coming and you're like, I have the right of way. And then you get hit. Now you're in the emergency room. You got broken leg, you know, whatever's going on. At that point, does it really matter whose fault it was? Because you're injured. And I have a lot of patients that come in to see a psychiatrist because their life is ruined. And they have this kind of, they have, I'll get to it in a second, a slide, but they have depression, they have anxiety, they have PTSD, some of them are suicidal and they just can't get their life back. And to those patients, it doesn't matter whose fault it was because their life is now ruined. So this slide, it talks about quality of life. She couldn't say no. And why couldn't she say no? Because she was intoxicated, she was sleeping, she didn't know what was going on, and she got taken advantage of. But where is she now? She's in my clinic crying and depressed and having panic attacks and trying to get her life back in order and it doesn't matter to her that it wasn't her fault. Okay? So I think we need to focus on that. What is the consequence regardless of whether whose fault it is? What is the consequence? And focus on that and let people know. This is what might happen to you if you get yourself intoxicated to the point where you cannot defend yourself. Yes, it's not going to be your fault, but it's going to be your life that now you have to deal with. Okay? So there you go. Anxiety, depression, panic attacks, PTSD, problems with intimacy. A few months ago, I had a lady come in in her 40s. She came in with her husband. She was in her 40s. When she was 18 years old, she joined the Army. She went to a party. Somebody put something in her drink. She got intoxicated. She got raped that night. She knows who raped her. And she got pregnant. Okay? She had an abortion. But she felt like she couldn't tell anybody because in her family, they didn't drink. And she had never had a drink before until she joined the Army. So she didn't want to go back and tell her family members that she got drunk because they were going to say, well, why were you drinking anyway? You know we don't drink. So she couldn't talk to her family. And then they didn't believe in abortion. 
and now she got an abortion. So how is she going to tell her family that? She couldn't, and she didn't. And she lived through that trauma, and now she's in her 40s, and she comes to see me with her husband. And there is no intimacy in that relationship because she cannot go there with her now husband. Okay? And we're talking about it, and she breaks down bawling in my office. She's in her 40s now. This happened to her when she was 18. So it continues to stay with you for the rest of your life, is my point, for some people. And yes, some people get to the point where they actually commit suicide because their quality of life has just been completely ruined. And they try to get it back, but they can't. So what is consent? How do, you, how do we come define consent? And for the military, if you look at the manual for courts martial in Article 120, it's going to talk to you about consent and what that means. So obviously here, these people cannot consent. They're passed out. They're sleeping. But the verbiage from the manual for court martial says, sleeping or unconscious or otherwise unaware of the act. If a person is in that state, they cannot consent. OK? Also, it says, incapable of consenting due to the impairment by any drug, intoxicant, or other substance. That's what it says in the manual for courts martial. But if you look at that picture, who in that picture is incapable of consenting due to impairment by a drug, intoxicant, or other substance? Can you tell? I mean, how do you know? You don't. And there's no way to tell from this picture. Now, in the previous one, it was obvious, right? Because they were passed out. This one, it's obvious. Well, this one is not. So what do I recommend you tell your service members or your soldiers or your sailors or Marines? If you're at a party and people have been drinking, you might not want to take it to the next step and have sex. But again, you know, talking about mostly young 18, 24 year olds, what do they do? When they go out on a Friday night, what are they trying to do? I mean, let's just be honest. They want to go out, they want to go to a bar, they want to have a couple drinks, and they want to hook up. That's what they want to do. Now, I don't see any 18, 24 year olds in the room, but think back a few years. Some of you may have thought like that when you were that age. Hey, we're going to go out, we're going to party, we're going to have a good time, and I hope I get lucky tonight. Right? Probably, okay, maybe you guys read about that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe you read about it. I don't know. And I've had clients that have come back and tell me that they made a restricted report, and then they changed it to unrestricted, and they got questioned as to, well, why did you do that? Why didn't you just make it unrestricted from the beginning? You must be hiding something. You must have had the, you know, something that you're trying to make a point, or you probably got mad at the per you know, It's going to be talked about. So people just need to understand that. They have a right to, to choose whether they want to make a restricted report or unrestricted report. But they may have to explain why they changed it from restricted to unrestricted. OK? Just a part of the education process, because a lot of people don't know that. They're going to have to explain that. The other thing is delayed reporting. If you delay a report, yes, you can still go and get prosecution and everything. I had a case where a service member said she was raped three years ago by her boyfriend. The first time that they met, he raped her. They became boyfriend and girlfriend, and they dated for three months afterwards. And they had consensual sex for three months until they broke up. Well, three years after that, she reported the first encounter as rape. And he was convicted. He's in prison right now. He got four years. So what happens when you do a delay report, you can still get a conviction. But I think in the experience that I've seen, if you do a delayed report, you're going to have to justify why you delayed it. Because the opposing side is going to say, why, did, why didn't you report it right away? And most people are going to think, well, yeah, if it happened, you would report it right away. But there's counterintuitive behavior that gets explained in courtroom. So just let people know, if you delay the report, you're probably going to get asked a question as to why did you delay it? Why didn't you report it right away?
because some people don't understand why anybody would delay, wait six months or a year to report something. It just seems kind of counterintuitive, okay? Not that it's right, not that it's wrong, just know that it may be questioned and that person may have to give their explanation as to why they did it. Chain of command, you have to stay neutral. Oftentimes, people get ostracized in the unit. The allegation comes in, the soldiers know about it, and people pick sides. Oh, I know he did it because he's X, Y, and Z. Or I know he didn't do it because he would never do that. Or I know she did it because she, and people start picking sides. The chain of command has to stay neutral. Okay, they're still your soldiers. They both still have rights. Because at this point, you don't know what the investigation is going to turn up. So be very careful not to pick sides. The other thing with the, with the Army now, if you are an alleged victim of sexual assault, you will get a special victim's counsel, which is an attorney that is for the victim that's there to help the victim along the way, or the alleged victim along the way throughout the process. OK? A lot of people don't know that. But they will get assigned a special victim's counsel. Okay? The Air Force was doing this a few years longer than the Army, but I think just recently, maybe within the last year or two, the Army started this program. Okay? But people don't know that that exists. So educate them about that. DNA evidence, very important. We're talking about not taking a bath. We're talking about not getting rid of the clothes. We're talking about trying to get an exam right away. The other thing that we talk about is blood alcohol concentration. Most of the cases that I do, there's no blood alcohol concentration because it never got done. Either people didn't go in or delayed reporting. And now we're trying to guess, okay, how intoxicated were they? What was their blood alcohol concentration? And at that point, we're just guessing because we don't have a real number. Okay, but the evidence is very important in helping to, to, um, uh, for the investigation and also for the trial. Soldiers need to know. Okay, you get accused of something, you're going to get flagged, it's going to happen. CID investigation is going to take place in the Army. The soldier's going to have a criminal record. A lot of soldiers don't know that. Okay, even if they get acquitted, you know what, you were still accused of this. It was still an investigation on you, and that is going to be there. They don't know that. Soldiers don't know that. So this is another thing that we need to let them know. Understanding rights. A lot of the soldiers that I talked to, they had no idea about this, what's my rights. No idea. They're just so confused. They get called in, they're sitting there, and they're so worried, and they're like, oh my God, you know, I, I never intended on doing anything to anybody, I don't know what's going on. They don't know about their rights. This is what they tell me, okay? But they do have a right to be silent. They do have a right to an attorney. And for whatever reason, they just don't know that is what they tell me. Or they're confused about it. Because most of them, they've never been in a criminal justice system. They've never been interviewed by the police or anything. And they're confused about the whole process. So they may think they understand what people are telling them, but they find out later that they don't. Or they didn't really know what it meant know that service member is entitled to an attorney. The key difference, this is the key difference, and again, a lot of soldiers don't know this. Most of the time, you are not going to be assigned a defense attorney until you've after, closer to you've been charged with something. Okay? Whereas, when you get accused of something, you can hire a civilian attorney if you want to. And this is what soldiers would tell me. I say, have you gone to JAG? They say, yeah, I went to JAG, but they said it's too early right now and I don't have a, you know, they know about what's going on, but they haven't assigned me a defense attorney. That's what they'll say. Have you been charged? No, I haven't been charged with anything. Okay. But if they reach out to a civilian attorney, they will probably take the case from day one. But guess how much it's going to cost? This is the thing. There you go. It's going to cost about $25,000 for that civilian attorney to take that case. Most soldiers do not know that. And most soldiers don't have $25,000 just lying around to pay for an attorney. Okay? 
but I've been involved in court martials where soldiers have gone with the JAG attorney, the, the uh, trial defense that's been assigned to them, and I've had cases where people have hired a civilian. It just depends on that soldier's choice, on what they want to do, what they feel more comfortable with, and their family and their resources. Okay? But let them know up front. If you get accused of something and you hire a civilian attorney, it's going to cost you about $25,000. People don't know that up front. And now they're kind of thrown into this process. So they can have a judge alone or they can have a jury. In the military, it's called a panel or a member. The panel members, the court martial members, it's not called a jury, but it's basically the same thing. The other key thing that people don't know is the difference between a federal uh, court, civilian court versus a court martial. And what does it take as far as the jury is concerned to get a conviction? In, a, in the civilian federal system, it calls for a unanimous decision. That means the entire jury has to agree. In the military, it's only two thirds. That's one thing that people don't know. They think it's unanimous just like it is in the civilian court, but it's not, it's two thirds. And the minimum number that you can have on a, court, on a general court martial as far as the panel members is five. You start off with 12 and then people start getting thrown off for whatever reasons, but the minimum number you can have is five. Most people end up, I don't know, I've been different court martials, six, seven, eight, just depends. But usually when you start the trial off, not everybody that's picked for the jury or the panel is going to stay. People are going to get thrown off for different reasons. I've also had people that were assaulted and they have no memory of what happened that night. But they just know their life has changed. They have problems, depression, anxiety, PTSD, suicidal thoughts, all this stuff, and they don't even remember what happened. Okay, life was going great. I went out to a party. I spent an hour or two hours there. I have no memory of whatever happened during that time frame. And now I'm sitting in prison for 12 years. I don't even remember what I did. Or the other example of I got assaulted. I know I got assaulted because I either, you know, physical, but I don't remember any of it. But I know it happened. Okay? And this is what happens to a lot of young well-intended service members. Again, like I said from the beginning, I'm not talking about the predators who go out and try to do this. They need to get prosecuted and convicted and they need to go to prison. I'm talking about the well-intended people that go out to have a good time, drink alcohol, make poor choices, and then find themselves in the criminal justice system either as an alleged victim or the accused. And they don't even remember the night, but yet their whole life the rest of their life is affected by that. Okay? So any questions? So I have any questions?